<laughs> Welcome to our January Book of the Month discussion with the one and only Chloe Gong, author of These Violent Delights. I'm Tiffany. I read by Tiffany. Dang it, I need to. Oh, I'm Alexandra at Twilling Pages. I'm going to get my copy of DVD. <laughs> and here we have Chloe. Hello. Chloe, do you want to introduce yourself and introduce your book? I am Chloe Gong. I am the author of this book, These Violent Delights, which is a Romeo and Juliet retelling set in 1920s Shanghai. Um, and it's about the heirs of two rival gangs who have to work together when a monster rises in the city and starts killing all their people. I'm very excited to be here. Woo, we love Chloe. Yay. And you can probably, I don't know if you can tell, but we are all wearing matching comfies because we want this to be a very chill, just chat with us about the book, chat with Chloe, because honestly, like what are we, Gen Z? We're like very low maintenance about all of this. Yeah. And it'd be really fun to talk about the book, especially because we're a subtle Asian book club from a diaspora perspective of Asian creators or Asian people who love reading. Yes. Okay. So if you have any questions, please let us know. And I also had a Google Doc of questions, but now I can't find it. Where'd it go? Well, DMs. Okay. Oh my gosh. So why don't we start off by talking about um, the fact that this is a Romeo and Juliet retelling, how did you really find the balance between what Shakespeare did and how you crafted your own story? Mm -hmm. I ripped it apart a lot is my question, as my answer is my question, not my question. I'm answering the question. <laughs> I ripped it apart a lot. So I sort of went into it like with a general idea of what I wanted to like redo, right? So I knew that Shakespeare had already done the blood feud and the star-crossed lovers and all of that aspect to it. And I was like, I'm really interested in these themes too, so I want to redo it as well. And then a lot of the first um, iterations of this book was a lot closer to the original play. So I followed the plot a lot more closely. There was like a, there were more proper like scenes that you actually pull from the play. So like there is already like a um, masquerade-esque scene in this book, but it used to be, you know, a lot closer to how it was. The plot used to unfold like event after event a lot closer to the play. And then the more I did it, um, the more I kind of realized that that was actually holding the story back. And that was like something I worked on my agent with a lot. And after we like got the book deal, that was something I worked with my editor a lot as well, being like, well, we've kind of transplanted these characters to a whole new setting with this whole new like social political climate. And so a lot of the original Shakespearean beats just don't really work anymore. Um, and so I had to actually realize that before I went back to the book and went, oh, I have to actually, you know, move away from it more if I want to give the heart of it more justice. And so then like that ended up getting, you know, the plot completely restitched. Now it is what it is today after I realized, you know, Shakespeare would be proud of me to just take his themes, but move away from the story. Yeah. We love it. It's a masterpiece and it was a really phenomenal read. Also just to, if you're here, be prepared for spoilers. Otherwise, oh. be gone. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Spoiler, are we spoilering? <laughs> yeah, we're spoilering. Okay. Love that. Love that for us. Yeah. So before we hopped on today's live, we saw some of Chloe's stories that were kind of spicy, not really spicy, but a common question that people ask Chloe is why is Roma Russian and not Chinese? If you want to talk a little bit about that. Okay. Let me expand on my, thank you for the microphone. Let me expand on my stories. It's very, I don't know why it comes up so often. Well, I do know why, but it comes up really often. And when it does come up, it comes up most often from like actually other Asian diaspora readers, right? And it usually comes from a good place in the sense that they want to see more representation, right? And that's like absolutely fine. It's just that like this isn't what like the surface level representation isn't what the point of this book was. And like, you know, in the future, I'm sure I'll write, you know, other Chinese Chinese pairings as well. But for this one, like the idea of it wasn't just to have like a Chinese character. It was to go deeper on like a, you know, geopolitical level of what these two characters actually mean, like in the city, caught in a blood feud and then being like oppressed by like the British and French groups, right? So you can stop me at any time, by the way. I could go on for this for quite a while. But <laughs> it was, cause 
I was grappling with Romeo and Juliet, right? And like the very prologue of Romeo and Juliet is two households, like both life and dignity. So to begin with, like it has to be these two groups that are equal in power, which the Chinese and the Russians like in 1920s were. And even on like a basic plot level, like they had the two groups just had to look different because they're in a blood feud, they're gonna shoot on sight. So it makes sense to make them two different groups, right? You know, that's why the white flowers Yes, they could have been Chinese. It just would have made my life a bit harder. Okay. But like, it's, it was, <laughs> I think a lot of the time, the, the reason why this comes up is because it's this like Americentric understanding of like race, right? They're like, we don't want the white man. And like, to begin with, not even all Russians look white. So that's its whole other can of worms. But like, the the whole like central idea is that Roma and Julia are very equally matched. Like they have no power imbalance between them. Whereas on the other hand, like say if Julia and Paul had ended up together, that would have been whack as hell because that's like actual like oppressor, right? But the whole point of it was that Russian Chinese pairing is completely equal in power. So two households both like a dignity and then paired up together is actually a combined force against the British French like imperialists in the city at that time. And even in today, like modern day, like a Chinese Russian pairing is inherently like a threat to the global like hegemonic West, right? Because it's the East combining forces like China and Russia had a long history of like sometimes they're allied, sometimes they're combative all of that stuff. So when I went in writing this, like this was all my thought process, right? It's like these larger themes of how history has moved and these, you know, smaller, more story level themes of how power and dynamics and everything works. And just like in general, how plot can turn out if you've got like the Chinese side and the Russian side, right? And yeah, honestly, that that's that's the whole bigger side of it. And then there's also just the fact that it's like, it's just history. Like there were just so many Russians. If I had not a single Russian in this book, that would have been unrealistic. So that's my... <laughs> yeah, I feel, like I feel like typically people forget that like Russia is still part of like Asia. Like it's like so close to China. And like also Shanghai in itself was like a very like culturally diverse city at that time because like you said like yeah. there are Russians there are Chinese and then there are like the French and then the British and there are so many like different types of different ethnicities and cultures in that hub so it wouldn't really make sense if you just had like two Chinese people Chinese, yeah it's also the fact that like once we enter 1920 Shanghai we enter a whole new social setting and I, I know like inherently because this book is published in America, like people will bring their American lens into it where like race is the most important thing when it comes to like representation. But if we've entered like a new social setting, like it, it becomes 1920s Shanghai, like ethnicity is what people are oppressing on and getting oppressed on like over. So it just, you know, the, the whole argument of this, we don't want to see this. Well, in this city that, they had different meanings. It doesn't mean like what it means here, like surface level wise. So, yeah. Yeah, I found this like, I really, really, really liked TBD because like, even though it was like super interesting with like plot, like you have this monster and you're trying to like, they're both like trying to figure out what's going on in the monster. You also talk a lot about like the communists versus the nationalists and then like, the factory strikes and a lot of what's going on in Chinese history at that time. Do you want to talk more about like historical background with like China, like Shanghai, given that it was so split with like all these foreign interferences and everything? Yeah, no, the history of it was definitely one of my favorite parts to like research and work with, because even though this is historical fantasy, I really wanted to stay true to the history because it's it's rooted in history and then I kind of add fantastical elements rather than like making it up but being like historically 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 inspired, which I know is also how some other historical fantasy will take that route more. But I wanted to take the route where, you know, the atmosphere and just the setting itself is as true to history as I could make it, even though I had to diverge sometimes, you know, to put the monster and everything in. But anything that I invented would come back to support the current like the current path of history I guess so I would never sort of diverge from history and I wouldn't ever um I guess reinterpret history like anything motivations and stuff that already exists just exacerbated more 
So um, I did a lot of research into like, you know, what was going on at that time. And because the Chinese Civil War breaks out in 1927, I wanted to really integrate that into the plot because it's just, it's something that I've never actually, you know, seen in Western media before. And I feel like for diaspora, that's something really interesting for us because it's, you know, it was in, for a lot of our families, it was in their history, but we've just been so removed from it. And I was studying a lot of it in class and studying like the more concrete facts of it. So then it was just, it was honestly quite like, it was, it was quite fun to take the facts and then kind of, weave a story out of it. And then it was kind of approached in the sense that it's gonna ramp up more in book two because book two gets more political as we get into 1927. Cause book one ends in 1926. We haven't hit like the highest peak of it yet, but book two gets a lot more political. The blood feud kind of falls back and we kind of get more into the nationalist communist conflict. Um, so it, it gets a lot more like, I guess, interesting the way that different characters in this like plot react to what's going on, right? Because, you know, Juliet is the head of a gang. She's very like, you know, gang centered. She's not necessarily gonna like what's happening to the city. Other characters like Kathleen are much more sympathetic and, you know, she might switch sides into the communist route because she's been like attending their meetings the whole time in book one, two, it'll continue on in book two. So it's, it, it's really, it's like an interesting like setting study and how I can portray the history that with you know, managed to put together now, like 100 years into the future. Then it's also a really interesting character study, the way that they react to these environments and like the different way they perceive what's going on in their city and all of that. Yeah. Ooh, I'm excited for it. That's Especially cool. because we, we talk about this all the time, but we like recently finished the popular trilogy and that obviously talked about the Chinese Civil War. So I feel like a lot of our book club members are primed <laughs> with that knowledge to go into book two. We're like, yes, also we understand what's going on. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Especially this time. The popular oh, the Poppy War is like latter civil war, right? So we're kind mm -hmm. of building these series are like building a timeline of the Chinese Civil War. Because TVD is like the lead up to it. And the mm -hmm. Poppy War is like, oh, the breakout and the fight. Yes. We need so. that. We need that. Speaking of diaspora representation, like we're all obviously children of diaspora, especially Julia and the story where she goes to New York, comes back, goes to New York again, and then comes back. And I think for Xandra in particular, like she's from Shanghai, you're from Shanghai. Mm -hmm. Like it's just all really cool to read about. So how did you go about like incorporating your experience or go about like writing this for, I don't know, like a diaspora audience maybe? Yeah, when I, when I, when I set out to write it, my like primary audience, cause you know how, when you write a book, like you want everyone to be able to read it. You want, you know, you want everyone to, you know, enjoy it, right? But I was also like writing also specifically for that Asian diaspora audience of, you know, I guess the teen that I was when I was like browsing, that, that's really funny because I was actually writing it when I was a teen. So like I was writing it exactly for myself as I was browsing those shelves, right? Because like earlier in my teen years, like when I was, you know, maybe 14, 15, there weren't like a lot of books that could really represent not only like what I looked like, but just who I was as a person, like how I, interacted with like family how I interact with culture how I feel about you know the certain type of like belonging to two worlds like, it's just not really something that had made its way to the shelves yet so like when I set out to write this it was kind of like I'm gonna help add to this like little niche that's like surely you know growing and even though Juliet is you know technically she goes over for education rather than like being an immigrant she gets colored like exactly with the sort of you know identity crises that like a diaspora reader would recognize so she's like intentionally a parallel of the sort of things we go through even though she's not you know exactly in that situation she's sort of supposed to serve as like a like a diaspora reader opens the book and they're like wow this feels like something that I've thought about. This is something that I recognized myself in. And so long as like they feel seen, like that's all I really set out to do. Just something that they can connect with and be like, like something, this is a person I relate to. Wow, it's that, that feeling, yeah. Especially I think there's a scene where Juliet was wearing a chi pao instead of wearing her like flapper dress. And then people are like, Who's that? And then just being identified based off of only like being from the West. I feel like whenever I go back to Taiwan, I'm like, I'm from America. 
<laughs> Sorry. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It just becomes a part of your identity when you're there. And then when you're in the West, like your Asian-ness is your identity. So it's all that like mishmash swaps, all of that stuff. Yeah. We got some questions from the audience about book two because people are really hyped. Um, um, do you have any news from book two that you can give us potentially or like when we could pre-order it, when we can find out more, what else you can tell us, how much are we gonna cry? Buckets. <laughs> no, Chloe, we're going to cry buckets. She's out for us with these like knives. <laughs> when it's like, when you remember that TVT is a Romeo and Juliet retelling. When you remember how Romeo and Juliet ends. <laughs> it's also when you remember like what happened in 1927. <laughs> but um the the cover is coming out on thursday so i assume the official description and pre-order links are also available on thursday they're all dropping um well they're dropping for us on riveted.lit rivetedlit.com but i'll also be tweeting it i'll be tweeting the cover and i'll be tweeting all the links so thursday 4th of february everyone mark your calendars but yeah, I am really, 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 really excited for everyone to read book two. So far, all my early readers have liked it. So no one's hated it. It's good. <laughs> but I, I do think book two is better than book one because I really got to hit the ground running and the story kind of manages to hit like, you know, the peak of what it can hit. Cause we've, we've done the first half already. Now we've, we're just going at it. All the characters are like at their boiling point, they're gonna collide with each other and all of that good stuff, that good meaty fleshy stuff. So I'm very excited for everyone to read it. I can't wait until Ox are out. Yeah. Excited for the yearning. <laughs> Especially because this book ends on such a <laughs> sad part, I don't know. <laughs> Ace's comment is, is coming for our tears. I feel like for book two, people have screamed more than they have cried. So. That's not reassuring. <laughs> I was like, don't worry, you're not gonna cry. You're just you're gonna scream. scream. It's not a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited. Okay. I'm excited. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about, I don't even know, there's so much we could talk about. But I guess one question that we had for like from our perspective was, Roma and Julia both battle a lot with like the inner conflicts of being heirs to their gang. So there's this like filial, I don't know how to pronounce it, like filial piety. Mm. The, yeah. You gotta like Wild. respect yeah. your elders. Okay, yeah. And then they also have to prove themselves, especially because like Julia is a girl in comparison to Tyler. Mm. And then Roma has that guy, I think his name is Dimitri. Like, yeah. But then they're also like, killing people is bad, but killing people <laughs> to survive. <laughs> how do you deal with this inner conflict and how did you really go about like creating this? Mm -hmm. Before I answer the question, fun fact, Dimitri was actually a um, homage to, I know you guys are reading the Vampire Academy series right now. He was a homage to Dimitri from Vampire Academy because <laughs> <laughs> I was obsessed with that series. But anyway, um, with Roma and Juliet's like heirdom, I guess, the like the way that they were first kind of created is that they had to be like two sides of the same coin because like the whole, you know, Roma and Juliet, they're the only two people in the city that actually understands what the other is going through. But because of the way that the city has been set up where the two gangs are like, you know, at war and the only two gangs that can actually destroy the other, like there are no, there's no other power in the city as mighty as they are in book one for now. Um, but because there's no other power, they can't make nice. But if they had made nice, they're essentially, you know, at their heart, they're like the same archetypical like person. But again, like because of the way that the setting and the city has split them, they've been forged into like these two different people, right? Because Juliet is so desperate to be taken like seriously, and she is already like hovering at the top. So she's become like this brutal, like no nonsense person. Whereas Roma is kind of this more like on the outside, he has to be cold because he has the resemblance of someone who's in power, but he actually just has no power at all. He doesn't want any of this. So it's been, it was something very interesting to kind of make them like 
logically and sensibly, they are like the same, the two sides of the same coin. They understand each other so well, but they're such different people. Like they're actually completely, the way, the kind of people that they've been forged into are so polar opposite and yet they have to work well together nonetheless because they're, you know, the star-crossed lovers and exes and everything. Yeah. Reading this book for the second time, I was like, Roma? I never realized how much of a simp and how much of a softy Roma is. He is such a simp! <laughs> Soft boy vibes! I can only write male simps. I realize this as I'm working on another project right now, um, but I am incapable of writing male love interests who aren't simps. It, the only question is how early they start simping. Yeah. <laughs> We're here for it. It was just so sweet i don't know i'm just like all here for it <laughs> yeah especially the short story short story was very pleasing to write because it was just fluff it was just fluff thick it wasn't even i think for some reason the short story is on goodreads now so i think people thought it was an official release my editor never even saw it my agent didn't even see it i was just i was like i'm gonna put this online i'm sure people will have fun and now i see it and people's like monthly wrap-up tweets being like oh i read the roma julia christmas special and i'm like guys <laughs> i just added it yesterday to my goodreads i was like oh, oh, reading challenge one done hey I'm I'm fair. To be fair, the amount of like fan fiction I consumed when I was younger, that should have counted as books. True. But it was just <laughs> literally author canon fic. Like <laughs> But it was so what it was like all of the fan fiction AUs like you were looking for, like that one trope where it's like, um I don't even remember. It was when, like when they like flip each other over, like when Juliet's like you know that like TikTok is like against the wall, and then Roma does that. And I was like, Chloe literally just oh, gave wow. us all the tropes in the fan fiction. I love the sound effect that you just did. <laughs> yeah. Um. Someone asked Abby asked which scene in TVD was your favorite to write because I feel like we're on the same topic. Which scene? I feel like. On a pure indulgence level, the Mantua scene was my favorite to write because it was just when everything came to a head, right? Like they finally had their big argument and then it was everything everyone was waiting for because they get together for 10 seconds and then she runs out. <laughs> so that was that was definitely so fun to write because it was just like the very pinnacle of the angst, right? Especially like the end scene where he, like she's literally holding a gun to his jaw. Like that was like, I just had so much fun setting that into scene um but that was that was like my favorite like you know all three scene to write but in general i think the um the zoom out scenes in the book like the prologue and i think it's chapter 12 and then like a few other here and there where you kind of see things from the omniscient city point of view that was really really like fun from my like english major head because then i felt like uh you know i felt like i was really flexing my writing muscles and shakespeare would be proud of me Shakespeare would be proud. For real. Um, this might be a fun question to talk about. What career area study would each TVD person go into? And I think there was also a question earlier about like, who's your favorite comfort character from each gang? Comfort character? My favorite um, comfort character is probably Marshall from the White Flowers. But from the Scarlet Gang, my, com my comfort character is probably just Juliet because she she's all of my like, um, when I'm mad, and you know, I can't stab people in real life. She gets to stab some people. So that's really fun. <laughs> Who else reads TVD and then just like pictures Chloe as Juliet when you're like doing the little movie thing in your head? <laughs> I feel like that's cause I'm so close to Juliet's age. Like if I had been older, that wouldn't be a thing probably, but I'll, I'll take that as a compliment. Also your TikTok outfit videos definitely help. <laughs> Honestly, that's just also me being self-indulgent. I'm like, I want to create content, but I'm also obsessed with myself and my book. So I'm going to create book content. We're here for it. We're here for it. <laughs> we love that for me. Wait, what was the other question that was there before? Uh, we... This one, this one, this one. Oh, oh yes. Okay. Because we're all TVD crew going educated. <laughs> Dying. What do you guys think? What career area of study? I've always said, I feel like Roma would be like a English or a gender studies major. Cause mm -hmm. I feel like Roma history. Is that, 
Yeah. Modern Roma would be, you know, those dark academia TikToks people make with the turtlenecks and like the plaid mm. blacks. And, uh, you know, I feel like he'd be, he'd be that kind. And I think I saw someone um, made a thread of like modern Roma and Julia and they said Julia would be like political studies or something. And yes. she was, yeah, you guys have seen her, right? And she was like, mm -hmm. um, like Julia drinks black coffee or something, argues <laughs> professors just to argue with them. And then Roma writes her like love letters and slips them under her dorm room. Yeah. Thank you, so painful. <laughs> I'm just indulging in all of my like, back then fan fiction, all the AUs. Same. It's like, <laughs> Chloe, how much, like what do we gotta do to get a college AU? I need it for the Goodreads challenge. Honestly, the thing is, like, I'm the type of person, or I'm the type of author where you ask me enough times, I genuinely will do it. Like, I just, I have no, like, I have no impulse control. Like, you know, other authors would be like, no, I have to work on this project. I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna do it. Yeah. Wait, so just to make sure, TVD2 comes out next year? This year. It's 2021. This, oh, right. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. It's ah, yes. <laughs> yeah, it's November sixteenth, twenty twenty one. If Ooh, it doesn't, that's just one day before their TVD release date. Yeah, where are you? Very excited. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Dense concentration. Marshall is a business major confirmed. I can see it. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, he would be. I don't know if he's too chaotic for a business major or if he would exactly be the chaotic business major, you know? See, okay, as a business major, we have like the, I feel like I'm on the chaotic side, but then we also have like those like investment banker, McKinsey. Yeah. Uh. We have Wharton, so I'm very familiar with the business majors. Hmm. Yeah, I think he could. Benedict would probably be like pre-med. Yeah, he's definitely yeah. like a bio or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we also had a lot of people ask about like, we're just jumping all over the place. I'm sorry, there's like no train of thought here. Um, about like you being a college student, like you writing in college. We also know you have a paper due tomorrow. So thanks for being here. Um, what's that like? And especially like you were on our Gen Z holiday party panel. If you want to talk a little bit about like, um, now that it's been a couple months since everything's been released, like, do you feel like you've learned a lot? Or I don't even know what this question is. I just wanted you to talk about being like Gen Z again or like being a college student. <laughs> yeah, I have. So I'm currently on page nine of my 15 page paper due tomorrow. So it's okay. After we get off, I'll I'll work on it more. And I'm sure I'm sure I'll have it done on time. <laughs> It'll be okay. <laughs> but yeah, I think being a student right now has been it's been kind of topsy turvy topsy turvy too because you know everything's on zoom now so it's kind of like i do have more time in the sense that i'm always sitting here in my room so i don't have to be running from class to class clubs are all gone you know student activities are all gone extracurriculars are all gone it's not like i can go to frat parties anymore so i'm just writing obviously but like I feel like even though I have more time now, it's really strange because now I can't go to like coffee stores and be like, okay, now I'm going to work on my paper here. And then when I come home, I'm writing Chloe. You no, know, instead like writing Chloe and student Chloe is kind of like mushed up together now. But yeah, the only way I can really keep track of it is to make really, really comprehensive calendars and try stay on task and yell at myself when I go off task. But it's been it's been okay like keeping myself on schedule but in general like right now pre post release being gen z i feel like i really really enjoy connecting with like my readers cuz i almost feel like i can like talk to them more cuz i live online anyway like i know how twitter works i know the rules of like Twitter lingo, you know, like I know how TikTok works. So I feel like it's really easy for me to like talk to people. Um, but then there's, you know, there's always a worry. Like if I keyboard smash and call everyone oomphs, am I going to get taken seriously by the rest of the publishing who can see what I'm doing? Right. So there's, al mm -hmm. there's always like the trade off, like how much of my authentic, like younger self do I lean into and how much do I actually have to, you know, be the whole like professional that 
the industry expects of me. So it's a day by day. I just play it by air. It's yeah, because social media itself can be very overwhelming. Yeah, yeah. a lot so going on. Yeah, um, kind of related. But how does it feel to be a New York Times bestselling author? Feels very surreal. I it is. I manifested. <laughs> I kept my like expectations low, obviously. So when it happened, I was very happy, very ah, and you know, all of those big emotions. So I'm still very shooketh. Happy tears. You deserve it. I'm so happy for you. I'm like, I know her. Oh, <laughs> I know her. Oh, no. Okay, um, back up to the book a little bit because we're jumping around again. Um, why don't we talk a little bit about like what inspired the monster in the story? Because obviously that was not in Romeo and Juliet. And I think the first time I like heard about you pitching the monster, I imagined it very differently from like when you first like got through deal, very differently from like what it is when I read it with the whole insects thing. I was just like, I have to wash my hair. This is so, uh. <laughs> but it was so fascinating to read about. If you want to talk a little bit about like what inspired it? How did you come up with this? So, Prior to writing These Violent Delights, I had written a like high fantasy series. All of these were on Wattpad, by the way. So they were, they were all series because I was just pumping out series. I'd written a high fantasy series where people were falling sick to a sleeping sickness one by one. And then prior to that fantasy series, I was writing a mystery trilogy where people, there was like a serial killer at a high school. One of the students was a serial killer and they were just killing people one by one. So, <laughs> um, I feel like all of the books that I've written, like prior, has always had these stakes of people kind of getting taken out one by one. Because the most frightening thing that you can kind of encounter, like as a person, is something that you can't fight against. So you know, like death and like sickness, and in this case, you know, a contagious plague. They're like these bigger, larger than life. Bigger, larger. They're, they're these larger than life like concepts that you can't stop like as an individual. And I've always been interested in that kind of, you know, stuff, like the things, those kind of like high stakes plots, right? So I kind of took that into this book and prior to writing it, I had had a dream actually about a monster rising in like a, it wasn't the bund when I had the dream, but it was like a seaside town and then it was spreading like lice. So when I went into this book, that was just kind of the first idea. I was like, would be interesting to have a monster and a contagious disease through insects in the hair. That was, so that like point just came from a random dream. But the more I developed it, like the reason why I kind of stuck with it is cause you know, I think like I've talked about this before, but the monster is kind of this like colonialism, imperialism, like tangible metaphor, because while the rest of the city is kind of being taken over, like in a way that you can't really see, the monster's kind of invading people and making people, you know, tear at their own throats in a way that you can't see. So it's like visible damage and invisible damage. And I kind of wanted to give that like its whole metaphor on top of being, you know, just kind of bloody and violent in general as the city needed to be for this kind of setting. Yeah. I did not catch that metaphor. I was just like, bugs. Yeah. But that's <laughs> deep. That's like, it, it means so much more now that you understand it. <laughs> yeah, as you were saying that, I was like, wow, the duality, the depth. You have Romeo and Juliet, and then you have this like colonialism warfare going on with a literal monster. I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, yeah. but anyway, um, because like this is obviously a Romeo and Juliet retelling. Um, I know you talked about a little bit earlier about how like you strayed away from the original retelling, but then do you want to talk about why you chose to stray away from? the like insta love aspect of romeo and juliet because and you you chose to have them be exes which i'm like oh <laughs> spicy <laughs> but um yeah i think this was almost um a personal preference a, a lot of the these previous answers i've had like these deep like it was a metaphor it was colonialism but for this it was it's just because i like enemies to lovers that's just it was more my cup of tea um because what was coming out at the time that I was writing it? I read Daughter of Smoke and Bone, which is, you know, about basically like these star-crossed former lovers trying to find each other again. And 
What was the other one? The Cruel Prince wasn't out yet, so I don't think it was that. I feel like there was something else that did enemies to love. <gasps> it was the 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 um the winner's curse had oh, done oh, it had the angst in that one. <laughs> Like, you know, two people pitted on both sides, having to continuously betray each other. I thought those kind of dynamics were the most interesting that I could do in a city torn apart by war, right? So I wanted, you know, I put the insta love into the backstory instead, because that's something that felt the most, you know, angst driven. Like if they had all these memories, but now in present day, they can't be together anymore. But obviously, because we start the book with them set apart already, they're heading back into the romantic art, right? So with all that inspo and the need for like the most angst possible, it just felt more like right to make them, you know, exes to begin with. And then we start again. Yeah. I'm here for it. I was like, oh, the AU fan fiction were back and better than before. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Honestly, that was like one of my my big like complaints about the original Romeo and Juliet. I'm like, this is not realistic because why would this child? Well, I guess I guess it's because they're children. But I'm like, mm -hmm. they fall in love and then it ends in death on both parts within a span of like what a week? What's going on? But yeah, this is. Yeah. Yeah, and then I was reading this, I was like a little sus of Rosalind because I was like, do we trust you? Uh -uh. That's interesting, right? Because you have, I had to work with all of the like pre-existing like character associations. Everyone goes in so afraid for Marshall because we all know how Mercutio ends the play and everyone goes in sus of Rosalind because Rosalind is also Rosaline. So like, I mean, you're right to be sus. You can tell that there's something sus going on in book one. So in book two, you'll find out like what's going on and all of that. So it, it, they had like these pre-built settings, which is so great for me. Cause then like I have, you, you know, the literary technique Chekhov's gun, where like, if you see a gun in act one and it's hanging on the wall, it's going to go off in act three. Oh, no, we did not. Well, it, it's like a literary technique, right? I feel like retellings are kind of like that. You give them these characters and because people already know who they are in the original, something's got to happen with them, like in Act 3, right? So, oh, because we're we're allowed to talk spoilers, right? Because, <laughs> because in Romeo and Juliet, you know that Juliet fake kills herself with a potion. And so when she gets the serum from Lawrence in like chapter, somewhere in the latter middle, immediately you're like thought is, oh, she's going to take it. But then she gives it to Marshall instead at the very end, which is like, people are waiting for it, right? This whole time, <gasps> you have to fake her death. But then Marshall does it instead, which is, I loved working with that because some people managed to pick up that he wasn't dead even before the reveal happened. And some people, if they're less familiar with Romeo and Juliet, you get surprised more. So it was just, oh, my English major head was like... Yeah. Oh my god, now I'm just like Chloe, big brain energy. But when you said that, I was like, wait a second. This better not mean because Marshall took it and he's like not actually dead. Benedict in his sadness better not try to like kill himself or I'm gonna yell at you, Chloe. Because he's in agony over Marshall being dead. What have I adapted? What haven't I adapted? I guess we will see. Guess we'll never know. Um, we will know in November. <laughs> We also had a question earlier on because I don't remember if Kathleen was in the original Romeo and Juliet play, but I'll, I'll try to find she, I think Ace asked it earlier, but like yeah. Kathleen in this book is like hinted to be trans because of like the whole Celia and then like the real Kathleen like dying when they were sick and stuff. Like how did you go about incorporating this into the book? Mm -hmm. So Kathleen is not a character in Romeo and Juliet, but I actually, I can't talk too much about this because there's a play within a play in These Miles of Lights. If you're really eagle-eyed and your Shakespeare head is really screwed on, you can tell what my next project is about to be because there is, there's a certain portion of it you can carve out. That's all I'll say. But um, <laughs> Chloe really proven us that we're just dumb. <laughs> yeah, no, I have to read this again. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, like read between the lines. It wasn't. Most people sh shouldn't pick it up because it was very, very like you probably can't until I like told you to go looking for it. And even if you look for it, you have to know like the other play within a play first. So it's 
I'll, I'll tell you after the live stream. <laughs> yeah, but um, yeah, so with caffeine, she didn't first exist. She kind of, um, I needed, you know, more on Juliet's side with the Scarlets. So I pulled Rosalind and Kathleen in. And, you know, because I wanted to write in like, you know, actual LGBT characters, even though 1920 Shanghai probably wasn't a very friendly time with people of those identities, obviously, because, you know, it was history. But I wanted to incorporate it because it's impossible that they didn't exist. They were there. They get like brushed under the rug in true history. They get snipped out of the real narratives. So I, you know, it was basically just my intention to have trans characters and gay characters existing. They just, they were there. Um, but yeah, with her like sister backstory, that was like, in a way to, you know, naturally incorporate it in, in a sense that, you know, only Juliet knows about like, you know, she being Celia and it'll play more into like account in book two, right? Because this whole time Kathleen hasn't like had a chance to be herself. Her name's not even Kathleen. It's just something she has to take on for safety. Um, and there's, there's actually a line in the book where I wrote this before Taylor Swift came out with folklore but there's a line in it where Kathleen compares herself to a mirror ball and everyone screenshots that and goes, is this a mirror ball reference? And I was like, oh my God, I actually wrote that before Taylor Swift wrote it. So brainwaves are on the same length here, but it's it's definitely something of her character that's gonna play into account more where she kind of has to, you know, really take from like who she can be in a setting that's so dangerous, you know? But yeah, it'll be, it's, yeah, it'll be good. I'll we'll find out more in book two. We'll find out more. Yeah. The mystery. Yeah. Um, okay. Someone said, one of my friends said this, but Rosalind is spending a lot of time away from Juliet, which is why she can't be the best spy. Possibility of Kathleen. Oh, like someone's a spy. I definitely think someone's a spy. We just don't know who. There is a spy. Book one said that there was a spy. Book two, you will find out who it is. Because the thing is, the fact that this is a duology, there were some threads I had to leave loose in book one. Sometimes people are like, why didn't you wrap that up? And I'm like, there's still a book two coming. Like, that's how duologies work. It's coming. I'm, I promise. <laughs> yeah. Um, we kind of went through the questions that we prepared beforehand, but like, from your perspective, are there any questions that like you wish you got asked during these types of events? Oh, that is a good question. I, I don't know. I don't, I feel like most questions during these events are like, they're good questions. They're meaty questions. I enjoy giving out to them. <laughs> yeah. One character I hope we get more about is Alyssa for sure, because she's so cute. She's my favorite. Cause she's so young. She's so much younger than everyone else. So she's so much more fun to write from just crawling around everywhere yeah also, people always underestimate her and i'm like kid's smart she is she has everything yeah yeah i feel like she'll be important in book two like definitely yeah. in some capacity mm -hmm. um is your next project also a duology or like a series um it is yeah i tend to write in series anyway i don't my brain doesn't work in standalone forms but yeah i have a i have a lot of like Un, like under the table pipeline things in YA because I'm always going to be writing YA. But the I'm writing an adult fantasy right now. I'm doing an Antony and Cleopatra retelling, which I haven't like, it's not, I'm still writing it. So that's not like anything official. I've just, you know, I'm telling people because otherwise I'll have to sit on it until I sell it. So I'm like, I'll just tell you guys. <laughs> yeah. Um, were there any scenes in the book that you wanted to write, but you had to like, edit it out or like your editor maybe took it out? Oh, I, so funny story. When I started working with my editor, we actually added more scenes than we cut because it was originally one book, right? And then we split into a duology. So we had the room to add a lot of stuff. But when I was with my agent, we did cut out a lot of um, more like historical based sections, not necessarily like whole scenes, but there were a lot more, um, especially as we got like deeper into political stuff. I wrote a lot of I wrote a lot of the scenes with a textbook in front of me, 
because I thought it was so fascinating. I was like, oh my God, this whole procession of like the ninth battalion moved from hair to hair to hair. I have to put all of these details into this book. And then when I was working with my agent on it, she was like, I'm Chloe. Chloe, this this reads a little like a textbook. And I was like, you know what? You're right. I kind of just copied and pasted a textbook. So we, <laughs> we cut a lot of that out. I was sad about because I think it's really interesting. But like on a craft level, that was absolutely the right choice because no one wants to read a textbook in a novel. <laughs> yeah. Do you have a favorite quote from TVD? Oh, What's my favorite quote? Hmm. The one that I always um, like sign with is the stars incline us, they do not bind us. It's one of like, I feel like it's very catchy, but what is my favorite? I've never really thought about that that deeply. Maybe something out of the prologue. I put a lot of my, like, I tried to flex as much as I could of my writing muscles in the prologue, so. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Prologue's beautiful. Oh. There's so many scenes where Juliet would say something that's just so meme -y. Like, she doesn't say Roma eats shoes in this book, but she says something like, of oh that God. capacity <laughs> in either the Christmas special or like in this book. And I'm just like, you know what? That's a mood. Do you guys know the cat meme, Father I Crave Violence? I got away with quoting that exactly in book two. So get ready for that. <laughs> Oh my god, so excited. Provided that they, provided that they don't take it out in our final proofreads, but we're, I've had it in copy edits now and it has survived. So come ox, I guess you'll see Father I Crave Violence. Yeah. Uh, do you, I think Ace's question is kind of fun. Like, do you ever base any of the characters on your friends rather than just R and J? No, I can't because I, would feel too bad if I had to like be mean to them or I have to make those characters be mean because I feel like if you base characters off people they think that you're inherently like portraying them in some way so I don't think I could do that <laughs> and then I'm like looking at the questions how have you felt about like all the response that you've gotten or maybe like what was something about publishing that you didn't expect Ooh. Oh. yeah hmm I feel like publishing that you didn't expect. I definitely went in with um, a lot of, cause I'm a very like over-prepared person cause I'm an anxious person. So I go into things very prepared. Like I feel like before each stage, I was always reading up on things or like I was talking to people about things and things about, you know, what to expect and all of that. So I, I think I was prepared for most of it. Um, and you know because like these mountains has been doing so well it's sort of I've been more pleasantly surprised than like you know disappointed or anything because I kept my expectations quite low so yeah I think everything has gone relatively smoothly knock on wood don't let me jinx myself <laughs> yeah <laughs> are you also a Libra like Juliet I'm a Sagittarius <gasps> we love to see it are you? No, I, I'm a Gemini, but Geminis and Sags go like mm. um, are very compatible in terms of like friendships. Yeah. I'm a Virgo, but I don't really know what the Sagittarius stereotype is. We're like wanderers. We're like just, we travel everywhere and we kind of take things very easily and everything's kind of just like chill sunglasses emoji that's the sad oh that's definitely you i saw the one though about like roma being a cancer i was like he's such a cancer yeah he's such a cancer <laughs> had to had to make them compatible you know wait i didn't realize that juliet was a libra she feels like she feels like she probably has like a lot of aries placements <laughs> she's I, like, I saw someone say that as well yeah she's got the yeah, she's got the attention, the attention seeking side of it. Oh, okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. We have a New Zealand fan in the audience talking about is it difficult to adjust to life in the US compared to NZ? It's it's been um I think it's different for me because I like came in for college. So I was already kind of in like an insulated college bubble. But 
it's definitely um i think you wouldn't expect it because new zealand's also like a western country like just you know in the us it's the same language and everything same culture but there are so many new zealand words that i didn't realize were new zealand words until i got here like i would say something like even like drink bottle because you guys say like water bottle and i'd be like can you guys get my drink bottle and they'd be like can i get your what and then i i would call um i called the living room a lounge and that was all or like that was all over my manuscript like people were just walking into the lounge and i actually meant the living room and no one pinged me like it made it into like final pass pages and then one day like i was talking to my friend and then i was like oh yeah i left it out in the lounge and he was like this a lounge and i was like yeah the the lounge and he was like you mean the living room and i was like do americans only call that the living room and he was like yeah and i was like oh no i need to change my manuscript <laughs> you know <laughs> this was the thought that i had like way earlier when we were talking about like the college i used but i was like i feel like tyler would definitely be a frat boy <laughs> 100% he would be the one standing at the front of the door being like who do you know here <laughs> yeah not a fan <laughs> not a fan yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you guys have any questions for Chloe please let us know we have like we usually go for around an hour but honestly like if you want to go over that's chill yeah yeah i'm available all night you guys i prefer you guys over my thesis so do keep me it's my use <laughs> procrastinate with chloe yeah <laughs> what happens when you live stream with a student author <laughs> it's also with like your other people i feel like most of your live streams are probably with like like adults here adults like oh, adults like your publisher adults? for example right like the simon teen like book club and then we're like <laughs> hey hey I, I feel like even with adult here adults like i can't hold back like the chaoticness like even if it's like a very like professional adult on the other side i'm just out here saying things <laughs> oh wait, wait that reminds me of a question we did have um if each of your character was a meme, which would they be? We know that Julia is the father I create violence one. <laughs> oh my god. I I need to answer this question with my like whole meme dossier in front of me. Like <laughs> there's this um there's this one meme of the do you know that those two birds where there's one that's like the black bird heading towards a white bird with like a huge ruffled neck? I don't know if you guys have seen it, but it's it's like a scared and also like happy bird. Well, that would be Roman Juliet. I don't know if you guys, I think it's on my meme page. <laughs> we'll look for it after the live. Yeah, we'll look yeah. for it after. Um, I'm like blanking on every meme that I've ever seen now. What do you guys think? Roma's just like every simp meme that's out there. He's yeah. the Mario Queen, you dropped this. Yes. <laughs> hmm. I sent you a TikTok before, Chloe, about like it was the it was a TikTok uh, it was an Instagram girl because I don't use TikTok, but it was like, oh this is gonna take me out. You know, like on a date or with a gun. It's like Surprise me. That's Juliet too. Oh uh, yeah. That that's all of them, honestly. I could see Marshall as that TikTok as well. Marshall and Benedict are the like two chaotic gays me. <laughs> oh yes. I I don't think I don't know if you guys have seen, but um I once found I tweeted a bunch of uh communist propaganda posters, which were just Marshall and Benedict, because they just looked like a happy married couple. Just like two men like uh, <laughs> touting the values of communism but they just they just looked like a couple so that's that's them as a meme yeah <laughs> they expect that probably not um someone also asked i feel like we kind of talked about it but like the fact that you're a gen z how does that affect how you write oh i think for me for my like actual writing style, it doesn't affect as much because I write fantasy and even like historical fantasy. So like they're, you know, in a whole different time and they talk differently. So I don't really get the chance to like put all my like Gen Z slang in. But I think it 
impacts like the stories I inherently gravitate towards and like the way that I kind of inherently tell them because I'm so plugged in like with the current like market and the audience right like I can't not be like I know a lot of older authors will have to research like they'll pick up books and they'll interview teens to see what they're you know into but I like kind of this is kind of where I you know exist as a person to begin with I don't really have to like mush myself in so the things that I gravitate towards are like the things that people are like you know seeking to read because I'm seeking to read it so in a sense I think it's really helped me you know figure out what kind of things I'm trying to write in my books and what kind of things I'm trying to write next because it's where you know the current YA like socket is and I'm like stick my hand right in it yeah. That's why I was like the electrical outlet. You like stick my hand in it. Um, would you ever want to write like a contemporary? Because I feel like that is where the memes thrive. That's like where Tashi is like thriving. I saw Tashi in the comments earlier. <laughs> Let's answer Tashi's question after this. But <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll get there too. I don't know. I would write um, contemporary fantasy. But I don't know if I can actually pull off contemporary contemporary because I feel like I everything I write somehow ends up with murder and violence as a stake. And I don't know how I would pull that off in contemporary. So I have like written contemporary and that I've written mystery because people got to die. <laughs> so like, if anything, I think I would, you know, try reinvigorate the YA, like, you know, mystery niche rather than the YA contemporary niche because I'm just a bit too violent for that yeah wait, someone did okay, wait yeah. wait we're answering Tashi's question because I need to know I need to know the Tales of Song is Chloe um okay well my current work in progress is my Antony and Cleopatra adult retelling and the closest is probably Taylor Swift's False God which is off the Lover album surprisingly yeah, much to think about. Yeah. So, so what Jan put, Benedict, are you lost, Marshall? Lost in your eyes, homie. That's a good one. Wait, I need to find this. Where is it? It's like something that should be on the inquiry. Oh. Do you have a dream fan art scene? A dream fan art scene? Oh my God, the um, the scene in Mantua, the one I was describing before, where she's holding the gun to his jaw. I want one of them playing marbles on their kids. Oh, yeah, that'd be really cute. Yeah. It's okay. At some point, I'll just, I'll just start commissioning them. I feel like that's also my Gen Z chaoticness. I'm like, I won't even wait around. I will pay people to draw me things. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, okay. Tasha's comment about MI65. Have you ever read the Gallagher Girls books growing I up? Love. I love the Gallagher Girls. Oh. Yes. <laughs> I we must say you should write it, but. Please. Please. No, Tashi's the one that has to write MI6 spies. Don't, don't pin this on me. Tashi, we need it. Yeah. Yeah, Zan and I literally grew up with Gallagher Girls. They were so good. Yeah. I remember the first book, Um, I had it in my like year eight desk because I thought the title was so cool. It was something like, I'd tell you I love you, but then I have to kill you, right? Yeah. I was like, oh my God, this is such a cool title. And I was just carrying it around like face out everywhere because I wanted people to ask me about it. I'd be like, oh, I'm reading a book about um, girl spies. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Man. Good times. There are so many good questions. Oh, I like this one. Um, would you rather would you rather get TV picked up as a TV or movie? I honestly have no preference because like if they want to do it, I'd watch it. And I think the thing with adaptations is that like they can just get you know so liberal. They can just do whatever they want, and it would just build a whole new world into itself. So I'm not picky. I am very um, what's the word? nonchalant about the mediums that they come in. I encourage them all. Yeah. I'm so excited. It would look so good. The aesthetic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's just having a moment. I'm like, I need to see it. See on the big screen. Okay, my AirPods died earlier, so I'm sorry if there's an echo. Oh. But Chloe, do you want to tell us your favorite course in college? 
My favorite course in college. Oh, hmm. I I've taken a lot of really good courses. Um, one of my favorites was this one on. Uh, <laughs> It was an English class on monsters in film and literature, which was really interesting because they did like a whole deep dive on like the symbolic, um, the symbolic presence of monsters and monstrosity and all of that. I didn't take a lot of it for TVD, to be quite honest. Like a lot of it actually like was just actually irrelevant to my book, but it was just something really interesting that I enjoy learning about. And then a lot of my other like favorite classes have been like East Asian history classes because mm -hmm. I love learning. I like um I like this question that someone submitted, which was this one. Do you have any other favorite? Or movies. Oh yeah, or movies. Just like anything in that era. Um, it's a bit earlier, but I, I've talked about I've talked about this before as well. But um, uh, Cassandra Clare's Chain of Gold is 1910s because it's the <gasps> era, so they overlap. Um, and I think Juliet and Matthew would be best friends because they have very similar personality types. Yeah, Did Sam recently released like the character cards on her blog. I saw. I am here for this crossover. I need someone to write this fanfic AU. Like, Chloe is here. She said it. She said it. <laughs> I approve it. I'm ready for it. Yeah. I'm so excited. Um. Okay. What is your favorite Chinese proverb or idiom? Or, like, cheng yu? I thought this was such a... When, when Tiffany sent me this question, I thought it was so funny. <laughs> I really didn't think about it, but I think um, my answer, I actually, I only know Shanghainese ones because like my parents only speak Shanghainese to me. My Mandarin's really shitty, but um, oh, am I allowed to swear on this? I think that was the first swear word I dropped. Anyway, <laughs> beep, we'll pretend I didn't say that. Um, my, the, the funniest one that my mom always says is like, whenever like I say something really confusing, she'll be like, um, which basically means I'm not the parasite in your stomach, which out of literal meaning is like, you have to tell me what you're talking about if you want me to know what you're talking about. Like you can't just like mumble or like expect me to know what you're thinking, which is just really, it's just such a strange idiom. Like I'm not your stomach's parasite. <laughs> <laughs> I find it funny because it also kind of relates to TVD because they're like parasites in their heads. So it's like. <laughs> it's the Shanghainese influence of it all. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. We had one more question from our fun questions from our Google Doc. But what are your quarantine hobbies slash like what have you been up to? My quarantine hobbies. Um, I guess my quarantine hobbies are really just writing and reading. I um, I don't know if this is something I'm allowed to do on camera without YouTube pinging me, but I, oh fuck. Oh no, I swore again. Um, but I started um, learning how to flip knives while sheathed, but it didn't work very well. Hold on. It's like, I kind of got the hang of like, Oh, that worked. I kind of like got the hang of flipping it really fast, but then I lost it again because I didn't do it for a few weeks. But did you ever have a phase where you just really wanted to learn knife throwing? Yeah. Because, <laughs> yeah. There was like this one phase where my YouTube history was just like knife throwing videos. If someone like looked it up, they'd be like, what is wrong with her? <laughs> I think I had that phase when Divergent was really big. <gasps> yes. And then when the Hunger Games movie came out because of Clove. Mm. Oh my God, I loved her. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, if anyone has any last questions, I guess a last question we could ask Chloe is like, are there any books that you're looking forward to or that you're enjoying right now? Oh, well, right now I am reading, well, I actually haven't started yet, but I'm about to pick up um, Malice by Heather Walter, who is my um, agent sister. It is a uh, FF Sleeping Beauty retelling and it's adult fantasy. So looking forward to that. I'm also going to read Clues to the Universe by Christina Lee. 
because we love supporting Gen Z. And speaking of Gen Z, <laughs> Counting Down With You by Tashi Buyan, pre-order now May 4th. And what else has been on my shelf recently? I think that's about my recent read. A lot of mine are like e-arcs now because, um, you know, people can't get the paper arcs to me because of COVID. But I also just read Gear Breakers um, by Zoe Hanamakuta. So very, very good. Much recommend. Um, what other e arcs did I read? It's always so hard to remember what I recently read if I don't have it like in front of me, if they're all just files. But yeah, I think that's all of my plugs. <laughs> Yeah. We love to see it, and we're definitely looking forward to reading all of these as well. Yeah. Yes. Do you have any lasting things you want to say to your audience, to the book club? Um, thank you for reading These Wild Delights as the book club. I hope you all enjoyed it. I hope the read was a enjoyable experience. I hope the discussion was an enjoyable experience. I hope this live stream was an enjoyable experience and I'm sure it was because we had such great hosts. So yeah. Look at us. Wow. <laughs> Not to be like we're so cute, but we're so cute. <laughs> Thank you all so much for being here with us. Our next book for February is We Are Not Free by Tracy Chi. And Super excited to read it. Hop on Facebook and Discord to talk about it with us. And we'll be having a live show for that at the end of the month too. Yay. Thanks for being here. Thanks Bye.